My name is Bob McElvey. I'm from right outside the Philadelphia area. And I'm the father of Bobby McElvey, who was killed in the lobby of the North Tower on September 11, 2001. But I've been searching to get the truth of exactly what happened to Bobby. And Bobby is a very interesting story. Bobby was one of the first 10 bodies found. Well, I finally found the doctor who examined him. He gave me an outline of the body and he described all the injuries he had. But the fact is that all his injuries were in the face, the front of his face, his face was blown off, massive cuts in his chest and his right arm were blown off. To me, that means explosion. So my brother was my best friend. David has always been a firefighter. My brother went in to save people's lives. I'm a family member trying to find out the answers to the murder of 3,000 plus people. I'm Jane Palacino. My husband Steve was 48 years old when he was killed on September 11th. I had no identification. You know, why is that? And you're sort of left with all these question marks, which is harder to deal with than the pain of losing somebody in that way. It seems to me we should know why over a thousand victims there are no trace for and no identification, no trace of over a thousand victims. Just a few years ago, they were still finding body parts on the roofs of buildings. What is that? We should know why there are over 700 bone fragments found on the top of Deutsche Bank building less than a half an inch long. We should have that information. Why were they up there? Why weren't they found? What kind of explosion was there? And the explosions were brought up many a times, talking to firemen, talking to medics, talking to everyone. Everybody talked about these explosions. I want the officials that are in power to ask the questions. I want answers. We never had answers. Nobody ever stopped to have a scientific investigation. I'm Dr. Bob Bowman, Lieutenant Colonel, United States Air Force, retired. Flew 101 combat missions in Vietnam, directed all the Star Wars programs under Presidents Ford and Carter. My PhD is in aeronautics and nuclear engineering from Caltech. I did postdoctoral work at the von Karman Institute in Brussels, Belgium, in finite element analysis. I taught at five universities and colleges, uh, serving as department head and assistant dean. The coup de grace for me was when I found out that Building 7 had collapsed later that day. And when I saw Building 7 come down, uh, to me, Building 7, the fact that it looks like a, a perfect controlled demolition of an intact building with no visible fires. I mean, that's what I call a smoking gun. I'm Jody Gibbs. I was licensed for general building and heavy construction as well as architecture over 35 years ago. I was educated at Yale University, the Harvard Graduate School of Design, the Yale Graduate School of Art and Architecture, and I taught at MIT as an adjunct faculty for a number of years in the Graduate School of Architecture. My reasons for uh, looking and demanding and urging people to uh, see that we get a judicial investigation are really very simple. No high-rise steel structure has ever been destroyed by a fire in the history of construction. We have eyewitness testimony of firemen, policemen, news reporters, and occupants of the building to explosions, an enormous number of eyewitness testimonies. Fourth, the building's fall at a speed uh, which can only occur if the structure has been removed, the vertical structure. Large, multi-ton beams were hurled hundreds of yards laterally. Gravity works vertically, not laterally. We also now have the evidence of phenomite and thermite explosives. Most of these things were not even mentioned in the 9-11 Commission report. It's for this reason I urge all architects and engineers to look into the matter, look at the evidence that is available, and sign on to the demands of architects and engineers for a 9-11 truth in demanding that we get a judicial investigation. In order to cover all of 9-11 research now, there's so many researchers, very good researchers and qualified around the world, that I have to assign some homework. And in fact, uh, I hope many of you have already read uh, some of these peer-reviewed papers. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, and let me put it more positively, as you read the peer-reviewed papers, it prepares you 
for understanding and sorting out the facts from the fiction. There's all sorts of fiction regarding 9-11, and uh, there are facts as well. Now, you know, as, as we look at science, uh, peer-reviewed papers are basically a final step in the process of research. Not, not a completely final step because then other scientists can read the paper, see what you've done, attempt to repeat the experiment, for example, uh, write a rebuttal paper. This is very common in science. And if I, I welcome this because then it, it gives us a chance to say, well, uh, maybe I did something wrong. We'll check. And uh, this is the case. I actually uh, issue a challenge to scientists throughout the world to read these three peer-reviewed papers in established journals and a fourth that I'll mention and rebut what is written here. See, that's a challenge. Now, I will um, discuss some things then that are contained in these papers. And so if you haven't done your homework, please uh, make note of these papers. You can go to the Journal of 9-11 Studies, which is uh, listed here at the top, Journal of 9-11 Studies.com, all one word. And that way you can link to these three very important papers and, and the fourth. Now, uh, let me just uh, tantalize you a little bit, hopefully, from this 14 points paper. Um, in this paper, I quote a letter from NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is under the Department of Commerce in the United States. And NIST ha was charged by Congress to do a study, a detailed study of the collapse of the uh, towers, the World Trade Center towers, as well as World Trade Center Building 7. And uh, in the letter, in this paper, I quote uh, from a letter from NIST, and I just want to quote that here. It's at the top of the uh, screen. NIST wrote to me and my colleagues, this letter is in response to your April 12, 2007 request for correction, which is a formal procedure saying, NIST, you made some errors. We need you to correct these. Answer us, please. They provided some answers, but then amongst those few answers, they admitted, we are unable to provide a full explanation of the total collapse referring to the World Trade Center towers. Now, you may not have heard that in the mainstream media. But the, the fact is, NIST admits that they were unable to provide a full explanation of the collapse of these uh, towers. This admission, after publishing some 10,000 pages uh, on the subject, and then they admit they're unable to provide a full explanation. So. Uh, please read the paper, and uh, I'll talk about some of these uh, weaknesses in the NIST argument as we go along. This is the fourth paper it's, uh, that I would ask you to read. Three in established journals. This one is in the Journal of 9-11 Studies. I don't claim that it's an established journal, but it certainly was a peer-reviewed paper. This is the first paper that I wrote on the subject of 9-11. <laughs> okay. All right. This is part of the homework assignment. Why indeed did the World Trade Center buildings completely collapse? Lots of uh, pictures and uh, background material. I will not be able to cover all that's in this paper or these other three papers today. Uh, in the environmentalist, um, Kevin Ryan, James Gurley, and myself, uh, Kevin is the first author, published a paper, Environmental Anomalies at the World Trade Center, Evidence for Energetic Materials. By this we mean uh, pyrotechnic or explosive materials. At this time we had considerable evidence building. And this is in the Envir Environmentalist, a very well-respected peer-reviewed journal and available, I'm sure, um, at all universities around the world, should be available easily. Finally, in the Open Chemical Physics Journal, our latest paper, Neil, Professor Niels Herrett, uh, Department of Chemistry, University of Copenhagen in Denmark. Active thermitic materials discovered in dust from the 9-11 World Trade Center catastrophe. Required reading. There were a lot of explosions through the elevator shafts, and people were blown right out of their clothes. I found their clothes and they were just shredded. I found their sneakers, 
There were shoes everywhere. I walked through these piles, through all this gray dirt, and it's like I'm walking through them, the people. I know it's all that's left of them. That was Detective Jennifer Abramowitz, NYPD. Edward Katia, FDNY. As my officer and I were looking at the South Tower, it just gave. It actually gave it a lower floor, not the floor where the plane hit, because we originally had thought there was like an internal detonation of explosives because it went in succession. Boom, 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 boom. And then the tower came down. That noise, it was a noise. Question, what did you hear? What did you see? Answer, it was a frigging noise. At first I thought it was, do you ever see professional demolition when they set the charges on certain floors and then you hear pop, 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 pop? That's exactly what, because I thought it was that. When I heard that frigging noise, that's when I saw the building coming down. teacher at college level and high school physics. And uh, I bring that into my work as you'll see as we go along. The starting point in science is observation. What you are seeing here is what happened to the North Tower of the World Trade Center, the second of three buildings to collapse on 9-11-2001. I use the word collapse, but words can be deceptive. What do you really see happening here? There's a tremendous amount of falling debris, but under the canopy of debris, do you see the rapid sequence of explosive ejections of material? Some of the jets have been clocked at over 100 miles per hour. I will call them explosions because it's hard to find other words that describe what we are seeing here. The explosions are not isolated and few. They are continuous and widespread. They move progressively down the faces of the building, keeping pace with the falling debris. Perhaps you can imagine a natural cause, I can't. Notice that the explosions are occurring on multiple floors at once, over a wide zone, not in a floor-by-floor -floor sequence that might be explained by pancaking collapse. Notice there are explosions far below the point of collapse. Some are isolated and focused. These are often referred to as squibs and are commonly seen in controlled demolitions. However, this is not a standard controlled demolition. The building is being progressively destroyed from the top down by waves of explosions, creating a huge debris field. The destruction is in waves, not just in one wave. Most obvious is a rapid sequence of explosions near the visible corner of the building. But simultaneously we can see another wave of explosions much further down the face of the building under the canopy of falling debris. Notice that both waves of explosions progress down the face of the building, nearly keeping pace with the falling debris just a few feet away. Slabs of concrete did not fall to the ground and smash to dust. There is almost no concrete in the rubble pile. Notice that the concrete is being forcefully ejected outward from the sides of the building, already pulverized to dust. Notice that embedded in the dust clouds are huge girders and entire sections of steel framing that are being hurled out of the building. The horizontal speed of some of the girders has been clocked at over 70 miles per hour. Some of these girders impale themselves in the sides of neighboring buildings. Some landed as much as two football fields away from the base of the tower. What could hurl heavy girders with such force and give them such speed? Some people have suggested that the weight of the tower crushing down on the girders caused them to flex, and they sprung sideways by a spring action. But we are not seeing isolated jumping girders. We are seeing a major fraction of the mass of the building, steel, concrete, office furniture, and the remains of human beings, reduced to small pieces of rubble and fine dust, and being explosively ejected in all directions. Bone fragments are found on the roofs of adjacent buildings. The bones were not crushed in the falling mass, or they would have been trapped in the debris pile. They were pulverized along with everything else and blown out in all directions. The NIST investigators have claimed that the top section of the building above the plane impact 
point came down like a pile driver, crushing the undamaged lower section of the building all the way to the ground. The top section of the building is, however, noticeably absent. There is nothing above the ring of explosions except for a fountain of debris. Can you see a pile driver? It does not appear that the building is being crushed by anything. The waves of destruction and explosive ejections of material are occurring over a wide zone that continues all the way to the top of what remains of the building. The scientists at NIST did not model the collapse of the towers. Their analysis was gravely flawed in many ways, but the biggest flaw was that the scope of their investigation was artificially limited. They took their analysis only to the point of initiation of collapse, as though all that followed was inevitable and needed no explanation. The scope of their investigation was artificially limited to what might have happened or could have happened to begin the collapse. What they explicitly did not take into account is what actually happened. By limiting their investigation to the natural precursors of collapse, the plane damage and the fire, they ruled out from the start any possibility of discovering evidence of planned demolition. In other words, anything that occurred during the collapse itself, such as the evidence you're seeing here, was explicitly scripted out of the investigation. Any analytical model of the collapse, no matter how simple or how sophisticated, is a bad model and bad science if it does not come back full circle to explain the actual observations. What do you see? Let's try another possibility. Non-horizontally launched projectiles have an upward velocity. We've all seen this type of motion when watching fireworks shoot high into the sky. In this example, the upward velocity and the outward velocity are equal, creating a 45 degree angle for the cannonball arc. The Y component represents up and down, and the X axis represents left and right. At the start, they are equal. At the top of the arc, the Y value is zero. As the cannonball falls to the original level of the cannon, its speed increases to its original value of 60 meters per second. Yet the X value remains the same throughout the flight of the cannonball. Let's compare this example to the North Tower debris. In a natural collapse, debris should fall close to the side of the building. However, in the case of the North Tower, we see upward explosions of dust and smoke in a symmetrical pattern. From within the falling debris, we can see an explosive puff of cloud rising as another section is ejected in an arc roughly 600 feet or two football fields away from the tower. The dust clouds following the ejected debris are consistent with an explosive event, whereas large chunks of concrete would normally result from a simple collapse. This would indicate that a powerful explosion must have ejected this heavy steel debris with equal upward and outward force to create this shape of projectile motion. The final report was released on October 26, 2005, producing over 10,000 pages. It will not explain the actual collapse of the buildings. They only claim to get to collapse initiation and state flatly that it led to global collapse. The report, admittedly, does not actually include the structural behavior of the tower after the conditions for initiation were reached and collapse became inevitable. We were charged with finding out the cause of the collapse, and we, we uh, found uh, what happened. I think uh, we scientifically demonstrated uh, what was required to initiate the collapse. Once the collapse initiated, the video evidence is rather clear. It, it was not stopped by the floors fell off, so there was no calculation that we did. Building uh, number seven. Drop the cleanest of all. Yet the world still knows nothing. This amazing free fall. There was no real reason. 
In a controlled environment, an object dropped from the roof of either Twin Tower would reach the ground in 9.2 seconds. The 9-11 Commission report will state, at 9.58, the South Tower collapsed in 10 seconds. Even NIST says the tops of the buildings came down essentially in free fall. Judge for yourself. What's the one element that you think folks in Scarborough country will say, holy smokes, I didn't know that. Well, I, I'd ask your producer if you would play a clip of Building 7, for example. We a clip will. That is Here you go. Tell great. us what we're about to see. Well, I can't see the cliff, but you, what you're seeing is Building there 7 is. was north of the World Trade Center site. It was damaged in the collapse of the North Tower on its south face. It was a 47-story tall, 570-foot tall building, and yet even the FEMA report in the investigation of the collapse of that building, again, was never hit by a plane. Collapsed at 5.20 in the afternoon on September 11th. But it was in such close proximity to the, to the Twin Towers. I mean, Absolutely. surely it paid a price because... Because it was so Absolutely, Michael, it did. However, again, the uh, NIST investigation said that the damage from the collapse of the North Tower took out structural columns on the south face. If you watch that clip, you can see, depending on the clip you're showing, whether or not the East Penthouse begins the collapse. Michael. And yet, and yet, Michael, let me, let me finish, though. And yet, the building does not collapse to the south in the direction of the damage. Right, it collapses straight down I want to ask you, I've got to move on seconds. because our time's left. I'm Richard Gage. Fires have never before caused the collapse of any skyscraper, even though there are numerous examples of much hotter, larger, and longer-lasting fires in these buildings. And in the case of Building 7, the fire that NIST said started the collapse had actually burned out over an hour before. It could not have caused the collapse, as NIST claims. Yet this 47-story modern steel frame skyscraper, which was not hit by an airplane, collapses mostly into its own footprint like a house of cards, as fast as a bowling ball falling off the side of the building in just under seven seconds. Listen to the experts. Building number seven uh, descended in free fall for the first 100 feet, which means that there was absolutely no resistance to the descent whatsoever. NIST has admitted it went into free fall for eight stories. And going from motionless to free fall instantly, that's a bothersome part of the puzzle because NIST never explained it. We've got a building that came down in its own footprint, so all of the columns really needed to be severed at the same time in order for that structure to fall the way that we saw. The symmetry is the smoking gun. The whole building completely comes down in one continuous motion. There couldn't have been any structural resistance. According to NIST, the failure occurred at column 79 on level 12. 
they're talking about a single columnar collapse or failure that resulted in a total collapse of the building. It is possible that you could have a, a local failure as a, as a result of a, fa a connection failing, but the likelihood of the, that failure dragging the entire building in such a fashion that all the columns would fail at the same time is an impossibility. Impossibility? Yeah. What I saw, it was a classic implosion. The center of the core, the penthouse area, starts to move first, and then the building follows along with it. I'd like to know why NIST excluded the document uh, from FEMA in Appendix C that documented the evidence of melting steel. Why is this forensic evidence not being included in the report? In an office fire, you cannot generate enough heat to melt steel. And yet we have evidence of molten iron. RJ Lee Company, USGS, and Dr. Stephen Jones's work. All three separately found these microspheres. In the dust, we found what we characterize as unreacted thermitic material in the shape of some very tiny red gray chips, which have different properties. And uh, in the reaction, they produce molten iron, which is the prime indication of a thermitic reaction and such a reaction can be used to destroy steel structure. What we have found is a modern version of thermite which we call nanothermite. There were these iron microspheres present in all of the dust samples that needed to have been formed in extremely high temperatures. I've independently seen thermitic activity within two separate independent samples of World Trade Center dust. My contention based on finding thermite residue in the dust is that it happened before. It didn't happen after in the, in the fires that ensued in the rubble pile afterwards. All the characteristics of the microspheres tell me that thermite was involved in melting those steel beams. So thermite, if it was present at the World Trade Center and created this molten metal that uh, so many witnesses and photographic evidence shows, would also explain the fact that the fires could not be put out at ground zero. The only thing that uh, is consistent with all of the evidence that we have that could cause such a thing is the use of thermite to cut through the steel. You get down below and you see molten steel Molten steel running down the channel mills. Like you're in a foundry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like a lot of like like Well, the manual gets into thermite, and if it says if you have melted steel or concrete, which we had on 9 11, we should test for it. It's this fused element of steel, mo molten steel, and concrete, and all of these things all fused by the heat into one single element. We're asking for an investigation that follows national standards. There is no excuse to not test for this. If terrorists use explosives in 93, why didn't we test for them? If all these witnesses heard explosions, why aren't we testing for them? NIST concedes that they found no evidence for explosives. So then we asked them, well, did you look? And they said, no, we did not look for explosives <laughs> or residues of explosives. So the preconceived notion of NIST is that there's no evidence for explosives and so there's no point in looking. Uh, that is the most unscientific thing that you can possibly think of, not to look because the, the, you don't expect to find evidence and in fact the evidence is overwhelming. They state these conclusions for which there's virtually no evidence and then they ignore conclusions that can be drawn from the evidence. The Freedom of Information Act request to NIST was denied with the claim that releasing this data might jeopardize public safety. How could it possibly jeopardize public safety? The destruction of evidence was a criminal act in itself. It was already being carted away and destroyed when the FEMA investigators got there about a month after September 11th. You can't do science when you are deprived of the evidence and when your hypothesis is the least valid instead of the most likely. And the most likely hypothesis in, in the case of Building 7 wasn't even mentioned. This is not science. 
The scientific forensic evidence, ignored by NIST, but carefully reviewed by teams of technical professionals, corroborates the hypothesis of explosive controlled demolition. Yeah, here's one of the guys who can tell you I'm okay, all right? Here, hold on. You want to call, you, you want to call your mother or something? Oh, you gotta get back to yeah. Mom, right. Don't worry about me. You need to make calls right now. Was a proper investigation performed that might have revealed the use of accelerants or explosives in World Trade Center 7's destruction? My name is Stephen Jones, a physicist. I received my uh, PhD in physics from Vanderbilt University in 1978, so I've been at this for over 30 years, studying various uh, subjects. I have published over 50 peer-reviewed papers in my career. NIST concedes that they found no evidence for explosives. So then we asked them, well, did you look? And they said, no, we did not look for explosives or residues of explosives. In the scientific method, we gather facts, and we then draw our conclusions from the fa facts, as on the left. In the political method, we start with a conclusion, and then we find what facts will support that conclusion, and we ignore all others, or we simply say, Oh, it's consistent with our, you know, our uh, theory that the fire uh, is, can explain it. And, and we have watched as scientific integrity has been undermined, and scientific research politicized in an effort to advance predetermined ideological agendas. At the end of any kind of science activity, people will agree that they have collected evidence that, that illustrates a hypothesis, and if it, the evidence is contradictory to the hypothesis. You have to, one has to abandon that hypothesis and look for another one. NIST writes, fuel oil fires did not play a role in the collapse of World Trade Center 7. As they studied this, they, they ruled that out. So it's not due to uh, debris from the uh, tower across the street. It's not due uh, to uh, oil, uh, diesel fuel for the generators. So here's what they blame, they blame it on fire. The challenge was to determine if a fire-induced floor system failure could occur in World Trade Center 7 under an ordinary building contents fire. Again, we see an example of the blinders being on. They're not trying, it should, I think, read, the challenge is to explain the collapse, the rapid and complete and symmetrical collapse of World Trade Center 7 on 9-11. But instead, their challenge is to see if, if they can get fire-induced uh, floor system failure, if that could explain it, okay, oh uh, dear. So how do they proceed? They used computer modeling. I might say, they admit in the report, they did not look at any steel samples from a World Trade Center 7. And what they did then is they used a computer model. It's a black box. Now, I would like to know if they would be willing to release this model, but so far uh, they've been unwilling to. There's a few things in this model that I think are mm, physically questionable. So see what you think, students. Quoting from the report, the steel was assumed in the FDS, this is their model, to be thermally thin. Thus, no thermal conductivity was used. Uh, let's see what that means. It means, uh, okay, so you have a, a, uh, you, you had a straight pin and you heat one end of it, like to get a sliver out, I do that uh, when I have a sliver. I heat one end, well pretty soon the end where I'm holding the uh, pin gets very hot. Uh, and this is because of thermal conductivity, which means the heat is transported along the steel. Now pin is stainless steel, uh, typically, and these beams are steel. But the thermal conductivity is not zero. I've done the experiment with the pen. I know it's not zero. But in the model, they turn it to zero. You see? Now, that helps it to work, of course. But even if you're not, even if you're NIST, you can't throw out the laws of physics. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, it just is mind boggling that they would do this trick. Furthermore, they write, in their report, it appeared likely the critical damage state where, where this thing started to uh, collapse occurred between three and a half and four hours. Now, burning office materials, here's a photo inside the, one of the World Trade Center buildings, typical type office. 
You know, how do you get this office materials to burn near the critical column, which they claim was uh, affected, for three and a half to four hours, particularly when NIST themselves published earlier data that shows how total heat release rate goes up. You see, it reaches a, a peak around, uh, what is that, somewhere around uh, 700 seconds, 12 minutes or something. You've burned fires. You've done the experiment. Uh, you can assemble all the paper and uh, toner uh, that you want, chairs, tables, you know. These things tend to burn out in half an hour. And you see that uh, rate of heat release tapering off quite rapidly. But no, they want not just uh, half an hour or 50 minutes, they want three and a half to four hours of burning near the critical column. What is there, someone in there pushing all the paper around this critical column? you know, to keep it fed for three and a half hours? I, I'm sorry, it's, it, it just boggles my mind. <laughs> and, and yet, um, that's what they say. Plus, plus, they turn the heat conductivity to zero. Well, sure, if you burn a, a fire under a critical column for three and a half hours, this office material, and turn the, the heat transport uh, conductivity to zero, yeah, I can imagine some effects will happen, but it's not physical. Uh, you can, like I say here, your computer model will allow you to do any crazy thing, but nature will not. You know, it will not. So we would like to see the model released, and uh, we will plug in realistic values. Uh, we'll give it the, it's well known, it's measured, you know, the heat conductivity for steel, we'll plug that in. It's an easy parameter to fix in their uh, model, and we'll, uh, we'll see how long it takes. I, I don't think it'll ever uh, collapse, though, under that condition. It took them three and a half hours with the heat conductivity off. Slides that we can look at. These are photographs through a microscope of these amazing red gray chips that we found in the World Trade Center dust. We all saw that dust, this voluminous dust. Well, <clears throat> in the dust there are large numbers of these uh, chips that look like this, this red material. So now we use uh, a scanning electron microscope to get this uh, remarkable image that appears in our paper showing uh, faceted grains of iron oxide and aluminum in the plates. If you look towards the center of this picture you can see both plates and these faceted grains. And the uh, gray material, it looks gray actually on this uh, uh, image from the electron microscope, is an organic and, you know, I have people to say, well, maybe the buildings collapsed and then somehow you just form this uh, nanothermite uh, material. <laughs> well, it turns out to be uh, quite a bit more complicated than that because of the, the very ultra fine. This is a 50,000 power. We can finally see the plate like um, structures containing aluminum and the faceted grains that are also very tiny, about 100 nanometers across. This is nano scale. <laughs> Uh, it's just hard to comprehend how difficult it is to reach that scale. And notice the uniformity, if you can uh, see then, in the uh, faceted um, iron oxide uh, grain, grains. <clears throat> in this um, plot, which is described in more detail in our paper, the blue curve shows the reaction of the red material from the World Trade Center. We did this with uh, from all four samples. The, this is one of the samples. Notice that it goes uh, to a high peak there in watts per gram. The red peak is from known nanothermite. This is from a paper published by uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, scientist there, which is just down the street, basically, <laughs> not too far away. And uh, this is a 2001 paper, meaning that they had worked on this, of course, uh, for years prior to this. Both of these curves show a very high energy release in short times. And in fact, the red material from the World Trade Center, seven years later, when we did the test, reacts more rapidly than known nanothermite. It's a very remarkable stuff. In the words of my uh, colleague, Dr. Fair, it blows up. And this is <laughs> from the World Trade Center dust, still blows up. Following the uh, uh, tests, these ignition tests in the DSC, we looked at the residue and we observed numerous iron-rich spheres, which Richard talked about, and so prevalent in the dust, 
Now these spheres were not present in the red material prior to ignition, but following ignition they are present. This uh, means, it doesn't just suggest, it means that there were, there were very high temperatures present. And furthermore, we find uh, iron oxide beforehand, I'll show you a date on that in a moment, and we find elemental iron, that is not enough oxygen to produce uh, iron oxide after ignition. That means the iron is reduced in chemi chemical terms, which means there was a thermite reaction. You know, no other way to reduce the iron and produce these spheres from this material as we have observed and published in a peer-reviewed paper. Uh, this is our paper. Dr. Niels Herrick is uh, first author uh, and he's doing a, a wonderful job of spreading the information about this science. This is a peer-reviewed paper in an established scientific journal. I want to emphasize that this paper has not yet been challenged in the literature, the peer-reviewed literature. In the protocol of science, the established um, protocol, we have published our findings. It took months to get this through peer review, I might say, but it has been published. About 9-11. 7 had collapsed later that day. And when I saw Building 7 come down, uh, to me, Building 7, the fact that it looks like a, a perfect controlled demolition of an intact building with no visible fires. I mean, that's what I call a smoking gun. I'm Jody Gibbs. I was licensed for general building and heavy construction as well as architecture over 35 years ago. I was educated at Yale University, the Harvard Graduate School of Design, the Yale Graduate School of Art and Architecture, and I taught at MIT as an adjunct faculty for a number of years in the Graduate School of Architecture. My reasons for uh, looking and demanding and urging people to uh, see that we get a judicial investigation are really very simple. No high-rise steel structure has ever been destroyed by a fire in the history of construction. We have eyewitness testimony of firemen, policemen, news reporters, and occupants of the building to explosions, an enormous number of eyewitness testimonies. Fourth, the buildings fall at a speed uh, which can only occur if the structure has been removed. The bone fragments found on the top of Deutsche Bank building less than a half an inch long. We should have that information. Why were they up there? Why weren't they found? What kind of explosion was there? And the explosions were brought up many a times, talking to firemen, talking to the medics, talking to everyone. Everybody talked about these explosions. I want the officials that are in power to ask the questions. I want answers. We never had answers. Nobody ever stopped to have a scientific investigation. I'm Dr. Bob Bowman, Lieutenant Colonel, United States Air Force, retired. Flew 101 combat missions in Vietnam, directed all the Star Wars programs under Presidents Ford and Carter. My PhD is in aeronautics and nuclear engineering from Caltech. I did postdoctoral work at the von Karman Institute in Brussels, Belgium, in finite element analysis. I taught at five universities and colleges, uh, serving as department head and assistant dean. The coup de grace for me was when I found out that buildings. My name is Bob McElvain. I'm from right outside the Philadelphia area. 
and I'm the father of Bobby McElvain, who was killed in the lobby of the North Tower on September 11, 2001. But I've been searching to get the truth of exactly what happened to Bobby, and Bobby is a very interesting story. Bobby was one of the first 10 bodies found. Well, I finally found the doctor who examined him. He gave me an outline of the body, and he described all the injuries he had. But the fact is that all his injuries were in the face, the front of his face, his face was blown off, massive cuts in his chest, and his right arm were blown off. To me, that means explosion. So my brother was my best friend. David has always been a firefighter. My brother went in to save people's lives. I'm a family member trying to find out the answers to the murder of 3,000 plus people. I'm Jane Palacino. My husband Steve was 48 years old when he was killed on September 11th. I had no identification. You know, why is that? And you're sort of left with all these question marks, which is harder to deal with than the pain of losing somebody in that way. It seems to me we should know why over a thousand victims there are no trace for and no identification, no trace of over a thousand victims. Just a few years ago, they were still finding body parts on the roofs of buildings. What is that? We should know why there are over 700. Vertical structure, large multi-ton beams were hurled hundreds of yards laterally. Gravity works vertically, not laterally. We also now have the evidence of phenomite and thermite explosives. Most of these things were not even mentioned in the 9-11 Commission report. It's for this reason I urge all architects and engineers to look into the matter, look at the evidence that is available, and sign on to the demands of architects and engineers for a 9-11 truth in demanding that we get a judicial investigation. In order to cover all of 9-11 research now, there's so many researchers, very good researchers and qualified around the world, that I have to assign some homework. And in fact, uh, I hope so, uh, many of you have already read uh, some of these peer-reviewed papers. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, and let me put it more positively, as you read the peer-reviewed papers, it prepares you for understanding and sorting out the facts from the fiction. There's all sorts of fiction regarding 9-11, and uh, there are facts as well. Now, you know, as...